Hello, class. So uh, this video is part one of our unit on positivism. I've decided to break it up into two different videos because it would both be uh, it, one would be kind of long and um, it's it's uh, advised to make uh, videos a little bit shorter uh, instead of one long one have a couple uh, shorter ones. Give me a second. So I'm going to divide our positivism um, unit up into two. Okay, so um, positivism is a literary and artistic philosophical movement um, that comes, comes out of romanticism, really. It's a reaction to romanticism. Um, well, Polish positivism in particular. Um, it is uh, it, it, the positivists of Poland um, kind of got their cue from uh, a, a French philosopher named Auguste Comte, um, who kind of started the, the positivism school, uh, positivist uh, philosophy. Um, so it comes especially out of, and I'm going to share a whiteboard so I can make notes for you. Um, so in Poland, Anyway, um, positivism, positive, positivism um, is a reaction to romanticism, um, especially Polish romanticism. So um, after uh, three failed uprisings against Russia, especially the um, uprising of 1863. Um, all three failed uprisings, but especially the uprising of 1863 was very detrimental to, to Polish um, culture, society, um, uh, biopower. Um, it had left Poland with with the failing uh, of the uprising, it left Poland um, deprived of a lot of its um, intellectual and political elite. Um, the people who took, took part in the uprising were usually people from the educated classes um, or the nobility. And when this failed uh, in Russia, uh, the Russian Empire uh, it squashed the the uprising. Um, they sent a sent a lot. In, they either killed or sent the um, the people who took part in the uprising off to um, exile, often in Siberia, um, sometimes uh, Kazakhstan. There's actually a lot of um, there's a a body of work that uh, deals specifically with um, um, Polish exiles coming back from Kazakhstan in particular. Um, you'll find a, a few different um, positive uh, pieces about that one called the uh, one is what is called the coming spring and it the beginning of the book is about uh, a young man's journey from Kazakhstan back to Poland he had been born there but as a but his father had taken play, part in the um, in the uprisings exiled to Kazakhstan he had never even seen Poland and so he grows up a little bit you know after several years uh, as a young like I don't know, 20 something and comes back to Poland, and that's it's it's a story about his life. So positivism then um, promoted a return to enlightenment values. Um, it was a practical philosophy, um, a, re, a, a um, rejection of mysticism and um, and um, um, spirit, the spirituality, the mysticism and the spirituality that the romantics had promoted. Um, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's literary type, I guess, not genre, but um, the kind of literature that it produced was realist. Um, and so at this time you get, um, you, you know, you, you really get prose being more for the first time in Polish literary history, prose becomes much more popular than poetry. Um, um, and it, the stories are realist. 
they're not told, you know, if, if you remember from the romantics, short stories, uh, which they, you know, that was not their genre. Their genre was poetry or drama, maybe, but drama in verse. Um, and, you know, the romantics, you know, if you especially remember Anheli or Cholera, uh, it's very weird, um, unreal, right? It's unrealism. It's, uh, it, 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 it uses a lot of symbolism and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, mystic uh, religiosity, right? Well, the positivists rejected that. They, they started writing much more in much more realistic ways. The stories are straightforward um, and they should be educational. Art for the positivist is, is, a, is an opportunity to teach. Um, you, at this time, you, um, you, painting becomes very realist. Um, uh, you don't get, um, you know, if, if, you'll see this in the stories we read for this unit. Um, stories are told, you know, they go back to Aristotelian kinds of storytellings where it has a beginning, middle, and end, right? Um, and you might call it more boring, I don't know, but it definitely looks experimental than the romantics. Um, uh, oh, and around the time you also get uh, journalism becomes very important uh, to the positivists. It all, uh, journalism is kind of central to their um, to their program um, and uh, to their cultural philosophical program. I guess I could uh, I would say, and this then leads to uh, their you know their goals uh, as a movement as a philosophical and artistic movement. So um, they they um, in contradiction to the Romantics, they started. Uh, proclaiming that direct military action was futile. So after three failed uprisings that left uh, Poland depleted of its intellectual and political elite, um, the positivists look around and, you know, there's, there's just devastation, devastation of Polish culture, of Polish, um, of Polish uh, uh, countryside, city that, you know, that the Russia, you know, the, the, the attempt to fight directly in, with, in, with arms against Russia or Prussia is just not going to, it's not going to come to any uh, con good conclusion for Poland. Uh, these are just too big, th these empires are just too big and too powerful, uh, too technologically advanced to, 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 to win against. Um, they, so they stress the cessation of armed struggle, uh, and instead of violence, they promoted uh, societal changes. Um, so, for example, they supported organic work, and that's kind of um, that's kind of a a, a vague term, but um, it, it's basically, you know, you, you, you go out into the masses and educate. Basically, it's mostly about education, but, you know, really any kind of work that uh, promotes the society, promote, you know, uh, supports culture, you know, of the people, um, that, that's what they were looking for. They promoted equal rights for women and minorities. So this was, and that includes uh, included universal uh, suffrage, education for the masses, um, free education, public education. This, these are all things that begin to uh, get um, begin to come about in, uh, in Polish culture at this time, Polish society, um, with the support of equal rights for women. This is really the first kind of feminism like true feminism that begins to uh, to occur in Poland. Um, with the next unit, you'll hear me talk about at this time, what is often referred to as third wave feminism in Poland. But the first two waves were really that feminist. <laughs> they were really kind of reactionary and misogynist, really. But, um, but a true feminism begins to get, uh, is born out of the positivist movement. Um, 
It also uh, promoted an intellectual, not military, but intellectual resistance against the German Kulturkampf. So uh, in the West, in the West of what was Poland. So um, the Prussian Empire has eaten up Western Poland, Russia, the Eastern bit, and Austria, the Southern bit. And in the Western bit that is controlled by Prussia, they're, be they're I mean, Russia, the Russian Empire did the same thing. They, they outlawed Polish language publications. If you were in school, you had to speak Russian if you were in the Russian section. And the Prussians did the same thing. If you were, um, if you were in the west of, of what was Poland, um, it was very difficult to publish uh, Polish language um, uh, publications, texts of any kind. Um, you weren't allowed to speak Polish in schools. Um, so there was this real drive by the German speaking Prussians to make Western Poland Germanic. Um, and, and so part of the positivist um, program was to resist this intellectually. Um, and so you see just tons of journalism uh, pop up around this time. Lots of little newspapers, weeklies, monthlies. Um, publication houses uh, are created to promote Polish uh, language texts. Um, so, um, um, we, uh, so yeah, that, that's that's the reason that journalism becomes so central to the positivist program um, and education. The you know especially universal education for everyone and universal suffrage, uh, voting rights and whatnot. Um, so aesthetically. And I talked about this just a little bit uh, just a second ago, but um, a little bit more in depth. It is anti-Gothic. So if you remember from the Romanticism lecture, uh, the Romantics loved Gothic settings and themes, right? Like dark castles, um, you know, everything always happens in, at, at night in, the, in mists and whatnot. Um, a lot of strange, weird, um, spiritual uh, things going on. Um, and uh, but the the positivists reject this. They they their their aesthetics are more anti-Gothic, anti-mystic. Um, it's realist, right? Naturalism, where you re realism and naturalism, where you describe everything as it is, right? Um, it should so for the positivist, um, you shouldn't have to like you know, you know struggle through a text to figure out what the heck is going on, right? Uh, you know, like with cholera, you know, why is this guy forced to spread plague, right? Um, you have to, you have to have like a, uh, you have to have training in, in um, theology in order to understand <laughs> a lot of the story. Um, or, you know, with Angeli, you have to have studied, you know, you have to have like some kind of knowledge of um, Slavic um, uh, mythology in order to understand exactly what's, what's, what the point of the story is. For the positivists, first, the story should be readable and understandable and education. But the, the lesson should not be difficult to, to figure out, right? It should just be plain. Um, and the novel also, uh, the novel becomes important for the first time in Poland. Um, before this, there, there had been a, a few uh novels throughout polish history literary history but um nothing like what we see happen in the in the positivist and really um this this I don't know, this is sometimes surprising for students um the novel is really in world literary history a very new invention um prose for a long time was not the most popular um uh genre or style uh, in literature throughout world literary history, uh, especially in the West. Uh, the epic was, you know, you know, if you think back to like ancient Greek uh, liter literary tradition, um, you know, the Odyssey and the Iliad, long verse poems, like that, that take hours, maybe a day to read, right? And it's all poetry. Um, but around this time, the novel really becomes more important. And um, 
a lot of people agree that the first true novel that was ever written was Cervantes' um, Don Quixote, which is like 16th century, I mean, which is very late in literary history. And so um, in Poland, the, uh, with positivism, the, um, and, and the novel is the perfect genre for this, right? For, for this um, program, for this, art, you know, this, this artistic and political movement, intellectual movement. Um, the a novel is, you know, straightforward. It has a definite beginning, it has a middle and it has an end, right? It's, it should be that simple. The, uh, the telling of story should be plain, right? It should be, uh, the, the point of it should be obvious and educational. Um, the, so yes, uh, so again, um, literature should educate more than just entertain, right? That's the, that's the uh, goal of, of positivist um, of positivist literature. So a really good example of like the quintessentially Polish positivist um, work is uh, a novel called The Doll by one of the authors we read for today, uh, Bolesław. Well, I have to change the Polish. Bolesław Prus. So um, you don't, we're not reading any of this, but this is just like the best example of positivist literature. So I have to talk about it a little bit. Um, so um, this is a, a novel, a big, huge novel. It's re actually really good. Um, and it centers around the protagonist, Wokulski. So Wokulski is this um, uh, entrepreneur in Warsaw. Uh, he's worked most of his life in this um, this shop that's like, um, I don't know what you would call it, like not, not a grocery store, but uh, I guess like an early department store. Um, that was that is owned actually by a German. So a German and his wife own this place, um, and he works for them. He he wants you know he he he's very driven. He you know he wants to get out of his current situation. Um, so he works very hard for them. But the the uh, the German owner is an old man. He ends up dying, and so Volkulski marries the widow uh, of of the of the German who owned this shop. And she eventually dies. Uh, she was already old, so you know he's he's already working uh, to you know kind of uh, his little machinations to um, to to get ahead in life. Um, so he at the beginning of the novel, he's not there actually. You hear you hear his story from a different character. He's in the Balkans. Uh, there's a war going on in the Balkans at the time, uh, you know, around Serbia and whatnot. And um, oh, something so. Something to keep in mind is the fact that Warsaw is run by the Russian Empire. Uh, but there are a lot of Germans, there are a lot of other uh, uh, nationalities uh, living there. Um, so he comes back to Warsaw and he's wealthy. He is incredibly wealthy because of what he's done in the Balkans. And basically, what he was was a war profiteer. <laughs> he went down to the Balkans to make money on the war. Selling, uh, probably selling some arms, but you know, selling like um, you know, bandages and you know, whatever, you know, like uh, medical stuff, you know. Uh, uh, but because of the the plight in because of the war in the Balkans, he's able to become a, a wealthy person. So he uh, comes back to Warsaw and he decides to become the you know a good positivist. Uh, you know, he he's he tries to be the positivist hero. He starts helping poor people. Uh, he, he pays for the education of a young single mother who was uh, about to turn to prostitution, uh, but he keeps her, he, he basically starts funding her education and her, um, her living uh, in order to keep her from doing that. Um, and what we come to find out is that he had done all this. He had gone off to become a wealthy man because he had fallen in love with a young noble lady. Um, and she is the, you know, she, she is, it's really kind of um, misogynistic, really, the way she's written. She's kind of written very two-dimensionally. Um, she's very shallow. Um, she spends her day reading, days reading uh, romantic literature. So she has, you know, 
terrible ideas about, you know, how the real world should be. Um, but he's fallen in love with her. Um, and he comes back to try to woo her. And it doesn't work because he's not part of the nobility. No matter how wealthy he can become, he's not going to be part of the, uh, of the nobility. Um, he even um, pays off her father's debts, pays off her debts, um, which offends her more than, you know, uh, endears her to him. Um, but eventually, like, because he's basically funding her father's, you know, gambling and, and living and whatnot, um, uh, she, uh, she he they begin to um court basically uh but in the end she rejects him and so we come to find out Vokulski's tragic flaw so he's trying to be the ideal positivist leader right using his money to 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 support organic work in poland um but he's still a romantic at heart he's still locked in romantic the you know the the um the ideology of romanticism and so he ends up, after he's rejected by, by the noble, the young noble lady, um, he kills himself in a really gothic and romantic way. He goes out into, a, uh, into the countryside to this dark ruined castle and blows himself up. And so he, no matter, you know, even though he's been trying to be this, you know, good positivist leader, he, he's still too much of a, he's still too stuck in the romantic period than the romantic ideology. Um, and so for Proust, this is a teaching moment. And he's telling us, don't let romantic dreams get the better of you, right? Um, the romantics led us to this moment of decline and decay, right? We have to do something different. We have to become positivist, right? We have to be practical in uh, how we deal with the world. So, um, I'm going to start with Proust, actually. I was going to do something else, but I think I'll start with Proust instead, because I don't re really have much of a discussion of his of his short story. Um, I think the discussion forum kind of does enough for you, but so I'm just going to uh, give a short little thing about Proust. Bolotsov Proust was actually born Alex Alexander Wolatsky. Uh, he, but Bruce was his um, his pen name. Uh, he lived from 1847 to 1912. At the age of 15, he actually fights in the uprising of 1863. And so this really um, forms a lot of his positivist thought, right? This 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 disastrous moment for Polish culture, the, the failed uprising, um, just turns him 180 degrees, right? He's this, he, you know, he's born and raised in this romanticist um, period, in this romanticist ideology, and after what he witnesses in the uh, uprising of 1863, he, he gives to all that up, and he becomes basically, you know, one of the leaders of the Polish positivist uh, movement. Um, he becomes very disillusioned with revolutionary thought and he uh, runs on wholeheartedly to the program of positivism. Uh, he wrote several novels, but he was really well known for his journalism at the time. Uh, he wrote a lot of uh, um, articles and newspapers and magazines and whatnot. So the short story we read uh, from him for today, The uh, Waistcoat, um, so you'll note the um, you'll note the realism of it. It is not a difficult story to follow. Uh, it's told very simply. Um, it is told from the is told about two people from the perspective of a third, which is um, it's not excitingly. Uh, experimental, but it, it, it's uh, it's complex uh, for for uh, uh, a short story. Um, one thing to note is the kind of I, I, I'll put it I'll say mild, and this is actually how I put it in the in the discussion form: mild anti-Semitism. So there is a Jewish um, peddler 
um, character in the story. And he's not written in the most, you know, polite of terms. You know, it's not, it's definitely not, you know, a piece of Nazi writing, but it is, it is, um, it is uh, problematic. It, it's, you, you know, even if you want to argue, you know, for the time, it's, you know, whatnot, but still, it's still problematic. So you still, you still see a bit of, um, a bit of the romanticist kind of national attitude um, creeping in into Bruce. Um, and you see this in the doll as well. There's, there are um, Jewish um, uh, money lenders that Wolkowski has to pay off for the, the nobleman uh, for his debts. Um, so it's, it's a little, it's a little rough to read sometimes, but, um, that's something to keep in mind is, is this not really raging anti-Semitic racist stuff, but it, it's, it's there. It, it's definitely, uh, there's definitely an undertone of that in the, in the story. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, and you know, the, but the, um, and the lesson of the waistcoat is, is, is very easy. It's, you know, what do two people do who've loved each other forever? What what are the you know what would they do to you know support each other um, to uh, keep the other from um, from uh, you know, falling into depression or being you know sad or whatnot? Um, it's almost a um, I don't know if you know this story the story of the Magi um, about the it's Christmas time. There's a woman who uh, has long hair. And she wants to get her husband a, um, a really nice present, but they're poor. Um, and so she gets him a, a she, she cuts her hair off and sells it to get him a nice gold uh, chain for his watch. He's, she has no chain for his watch at all. So she gives it to him and he laughs and he says, oh, and I, I got you this. She, he had actually sold his pocket watch for a nice set of uh, combs for her hair or barrettes or whatever they are. Uh, but she can't use them now because her hair is short. Um, and so, but <laughs> this is like a, like a more, you know, I guess a, a sadder version of that, an even sadder version of that, right? So um, the next author, I'm going to erase some of this. The, the next author we read for positivism uh, is actually kind of a, a Strange to be, he's, he's kind of a curious figure in positivism because um, a lot of the stuff he writes is, you know, um, aesthetically positivist, deals with realism and whatnot, but it's often, it often has this very romanticist bend, bent to it. So his name was Hendrik, um, Hendrik Schenkiewicz. 1846 to 1916. Um, in 1905, he actually won the Nobel Prize in literature um, for a novel called Quovadis, which is about uh, the early days of uh, Christianity and Rome and the um, the there are a lot of scenes of like Christians being fed to lions and whatnot. It takes place during uh, Nero's time. So, um, and he became very popular around the world for that novel, actually, because it was so Christian. Um, Polvadis is Latin for where are you going? It's the one of the last lines of the novel. Um, one of the um, apostles, one of the last living apostles uh, is leaving Rome be because there's been threats to his life. And he, uh, he's visited by Christ um, and Christ, uh, Christ is going into Rome, and the apostle asks him, "You know, quo vagis, my lord? So where are you going, my lord?" And he says, "Well, you've given up the faith. You're, you, uh, it's obvious you're not willing to, you know, die for your beliefs. So I'm going to go back and be crucified again." Uh, and the apostle says, "No, I'll go back." Um, and that became it was a very popular novel uh, around the world. He is best known for his trilogy, though, uh, which is still published in Poland in all kinds of editions, like nice leather bound, like gold leaf editions, paperback editions all over the place. You can't 
you can't throw a stick in Poland without hitting a copy of the trilogy. Uh, and these are three historical um, historical novels um, about three pre about um, three pre partition era wars in Poland. So in the golden age of Poland, when Poland was this huge uh, empire, um, and it, it, it's all about these three very important um, wars that take place in Poland, almost right on top of each other. They happen you know, one after another. Um, and really, th these are like, <laughs> these wars, even though Poland was successful, are really the beginning of the end of the Polish, of, of Polish hegemony in the area, because it, you know, even though they won all these invasions and whatnot against the Swedes, against the Russians, against the, and against the Ottomans, um, it really weakens Poland to a point that makes the partitions possible. Um, and it is... So this, it's especially this, the, the this series of novels really makes Szczykiewicz a kind of curious figure in positivism because these novels are, you know, he he um, the epigram, I guess you would call it, to the novels is for the uplifting of the nation's heart in Polish. I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's basically he's he's dedicating these novels to the nation, uh, to to you know. Uh, give them hope in a time when there is no nation, right? Um, and so it's it's kind of a it's very much a they're very much a, like a romanticist kind of purpose to the novels, although they're written in realist you know historical ways. So, um, but um, the the um, Lighthouse Keeper, which is the story we read for him, is a really good example of this. Once again, it's um, real. It's a real. It's aesthetically realist. I can spell aesthetically, but promotes romantic ideals. Um, so a lot of people kind of struggle with Shingovich in. in uh, pigeonholing him as a positivist because of uh, you know he writes as realistically but a lot of his stuff is is you know stuck on these you know romanticist um uh, in, in this romanticist uh, ideology of of um sacrifice for the nation struggle that kind of thing um so the lighthouse keeper is a really interesting story i think um it's the story of uh, an old polish man Who's been wandering most of his life? He's, you know, he's been kicked out of Poland because he took part in uh, the uprising. Uh, he's moved around the world, and his 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 biography is just one of constant uh, battle. He, you know, he takes part in wars all over the world. He takes part in the civil war for the north, um, and finally, he's just tired. And he comes to Central America to become a lighthouse keeper on the, a lonely. Um, Little peninsula out in the middle of the um, of the uh, um, Caribbean. Um, so what I want to do now is stop sharing this. So we're going to do a little bit of the uh, closed reading exercise that I uh, introduced to you. Um, so you have this text on our page on the Sakai page. I'm going to share the screen what it looks like. So I'd like you to get that out. You can pause the video and read along with me. And as you, uh, and what we're going to do is I'm going to read it aloud once. I'll pause the video, even though they need to, but um, I'll pause recording and you can pause the video and for 10 minutes, take notes on it. Um, and then I'll start up again and I'll give you a couple of my ideas and see if you uh, came up with the same thing. So, Falconbridge liked him at first sight. He only had to interview the man, hence the following conversation ensued. Where do you come from? I am a Pole. What have you been doing up until now? Wandering from place to place. A lighthouse keeper should stay in one place. I need a rest. Have you served at any time? Do you have any certificates of honorable government service? The old man drew from his breast pocket a faded silk rag, resembling a strip of tattered flag, unfolded it and said, here are the certificates. 
This cross I, re this cross I received in the, in the 1830 Polish uprising. The second is from the Carlist War. The third is the French Legion. The fourth I got in Hungary. Afterwards, I fought in the States against the South. They gave no crosses there. So here's the paper. So uh, I'm going to pause the recording. Uh, and then just come back. But um, take this time to uh, take a lot, as many notes as you can on the text. Okay. All right. So the, um, I'm wondering if you caught this little bit. So this is really interesting to me. So if you paid really close attention to my, <laughs> my couple of uh, lectures, you may have caught this. Um, but it, 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 you know, if, if you're not really, um into polish culture as much as someone like me you it may you may have skipped it you may not have seen it right so this line falconbridge asks him where do you come from right so where right so where um denote, denotes a geographic location right a geopolitical location often like when i ask where do you come from i'm asking about you know um a bordered place of some kind, a city, but a city is a is a is a um, is a political entity, right? A geopolitical entity. A state, a state is a geopolitical a county, a state, a country. These are all geopolitical entities. And when you ask that question, where do you come from? That's what you're asking, right? What is your really, you know, what is your nationality? Is is as much is almost a synonym for this question. Well, how does he answer? He says, I am a Pole, right? He doesn't say, I come from Poland. So this is important. There is no Poland. There is no geopolitical entity known as Poland at this time. So he can't answer that question. He has to say, I am a Pole, right? Um, and this, this just, you know, gets us into all kinds of directions with Polish literature and culture and history. Um, it gets us to the national anthem of Poland, right? Um, Polska nie zginęła kiedy my żyjemy. So Poland is still not. Um, yeah, Poland has has not been lost as long as we're alive, right? There's no geopolitical boundaries that are called Poland or this you know this thing, this place on a map that you can point to and say Poland, but there are people who say. I'm Polish, I am a Pole, and so the nation lives on, right? So that that little that those four words in in um Polish it would have been yes and Polakim, so two words. Um this gets us into these and all kinds of different, you know, all kinds of you know, links us to all these different uh cultural products, um the, you know, all these different events in history. Um, and so that that one line is is really kind of glaring to a polonist um so just a couple other points here right so he asks him what have you been doing you know and um he's a wanderer so all poles are wanderers at this time because there is no poland they're they're never even if you're in the the place that was poland you're still you're you're a vagabond right you have no you have no um place to call your own right um, and then he tell you know he tells him the things he's been he's been up to and he's been in all these different battles right, and you'll want to look these up just do a little Wikipedia you know the Carlos War he was in the French Legion uh, he was in Hungary and then he fought in the, in the states against the South um, so he's 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 kind of been not forced but just there's no other way for him to live right because of his vagabond. Um, uh, background, being forced into the vagabond life, this is just what he does. He goes from one battle to another. And that's really, he's he's kind of the everyman for Poland. He's the every Pole, right? This is just how Poles have to live. So um, just a little bit more about the, um, about, the uh, about the story. So it's really, I, I really think it's interesting, an interesting story um, at the very end, right? So, you know, it's just like a, a good tale. It has its, you know, 
kind of middle section that um, you know you may think is a little boring. You're like, why is this? You know, it's just talking about his daily life, but really that's kind of the the rising action of this story that comes to a very big climax at the top. Uh, but it takes a long time to get there. Um, and that's trying to stress that, you know, he is this, you know, he's, he thinks he wants this settled life. He's found a little spot that he can just, you know, rest in. But, um, but what happens? And what happens is he, he gets visited by a ghost from the past. Um, it's a really interesting moment. So the, the neat thing about this story is it keeps giving hints about this throughout, right? So he keep, you know, he, when we hear his thoughts, we keep, you know, he keeps thinking about, you know, feeling like he's been pushed by some unseen force throughout his life, that he's never had really much of a choice in anything, that he's always being kind of pushed in a, uh, by like, you know, uh, a whimsical universe, you know, this weird unseen power that just kind of pushes him uh, against his will to one place or another. Um, and so he one day gets a, a shipment of books in Polish, he, you know, which he probably hasn't read in forever. Um, and he doesn't know where they came from. And so again, he thinks this is this weird, um, unseen force in the universe that just wants to torture me with, you know, with, you know, against my will. But what do we know as the readers, right? He doesn't know this because he's forgotten, but we know as readers that it's very, you know, there's a very logical explanation to this. He sent some money to a Polish um, uh, emigre society, like a group in New York. He just, he had some money. So he's like, oh, I saw something in a paper about this group. So he's like, oh, I'll give them some money to support the cause, you know, whatever. And he forgets about it, but they don't forget about it. And we don't forget about it as the readers. So as readers, we actually know more than he does. And that's why he got these books. It had nothing to do with this strange unseen force in the universe. It's just this Polish society decides to send him some books to say thank you for the money, right? Um, and what book does he open? He opens Pan Tadeusz. So if you remember from my previous lecture, Pan Tadeusz is published in 1834. So it's, you know, he's not too far from this moment, right? He's not, you know, it's a few, maybe just a few decades, maybe, well, not even a few, maybe a couple decades from the publication of Pan Tadeusz. But he's never read it, right? He's never read, he's never even heard of Adam Miskevich because he wasn't there, right? He had, he had not been in Europe for so long. He has no idea what's going on in Polish literature. How could you keep up with something like that at that time? There's no internet, right? You can't just Google, you know, what's going on in Poland right now. Um, he's been cut off from Poland, right? Utterly for a long time. And he comes across this text that will become very important to Polish society. And he swoons, right? <laughs> Uh, everyone swoons at, in, in literature of this time. Um, it's such a great word. He starts reading it and he can't believe what he's reading, right? He is instantly taken back to Poland, right? His homeland. Um, you know, Litwo, Ojczyzna Moja, Litwo, Ojczyzna Moja, Ty jesteś jak zdrowie. Tylko ten Litwo, Ojczyzna Moja, Ty jesteś jak zdrowie. I can't remember. I had it memorized. Oh. It's going to bother me. I have to find it. Lipo, it is no moja TSS as jak zdrowia. Ile czy trzeba cenić ten tylko, że dowie kto to stracił? Dziś piekność po całej ozdobie widzę i opisuje botanstwo po tobie. So, uh, Lithuania, my fatherland, you're like health. How much one should value you, you will, uh, one will only find out when they've lost you. Today, your beauty in all its decoration or all its beauty 
uh, in all its glory, I guess, uh, I see and describe because I, I long for you, right? So he reads those first lines and just instantly blown away. Um, he knows what these, these things mean, what these, you know, these emotions mean. And he keeps reading and the rest of the, um, the opening is all about the, you know, take me back to um, the portrait of, of the Virgin Mary that hangs over Novo, over the, 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 the gates of Novo, Novo Grud, which is a city. Um, take me back to those rolling plains and those, you know, wheat filled, you know, wheat, wheat filled fields and whatnot of, of golden Lithuania. Um, and what happens? Tragedy. He's reading this. He becomes engrossed, enthralled. He swoons. He passes out from it, right? It knocks him on his back. And because he's passed out in, in a swoon, he can't light the, the, the lighthouse. And there's a storm that night and a, a shipwreck, right? So uh, he loses his job and he is sent packing. But he kind of, for the first time in a long time, right, there's a glow in his eyes. He, he seems, he, he's, he's like, who is it, Saul? One of them, who's struck by lightning, right, on his way back from somewhere, it's in the Bible. I'm referencing the Bible. I cannot remember who it is, but anyway. Uh, he's struck by lightning and actually seized for the first time in forever, right? Um, and so he's wandering again, but he seems happy now in his wandering, right? He's being, again, being forced to wander, but for some reason this time he's happy. So you can kind of, you can kind of see how Shinkovich kind of um, straddles this line between romanticism and positivism, right? It's, it's very realist. It's easy to understand. Uh, there's not a lot of symbolism in it. But at the same time, the main character is going off to live this romantic life now again, right? So uh, he, he's really kind of, like I said, he's a curious figure in, in positivism. All right, so that ends part one of the positivist lecture. Lectures? <laughs> Sounds like a podcast. Um, please look for my part two. I just need to stop. Oh, here it is. Okay. Bye-bye.